All right. Rest of you, open your Bibles to the sixth chapter of the book of Ephesians. We're continuing on our teaching and out of the book of Ephesians. And just to recap, I've lost my board in the process here somewhere. Um, but uh, we, the book of Ephesians is, is somewhat categorized into two parts. The first half of the book, first, first chapters 1 through 3. And then the second half, chapters 4 through 6. One, chapters 1 through 3 deal with what Jesus has done for us. Amen. What Jesus did for us. We call that grace. It is the Godward side of redemption. It is the Godward side of God's plan of salvation. It is His grace towards mankind, what He has done. And that, we deal with that throughout the book of Ephesians in the first three chapters. Then yet, Paul makes a transition starting in the fourth chapter where he says, uh, Therefore, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. And he begins to talk about, you know, things you shouldn't do, things that we are to do, uh, things that we don't do as Christians. And uh, that's called, you know, the side of, of, of redemption called do. Now, see, there's a manward side. The manward side is uh, what Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says, For in Christ Jesus we are, created in, uh, we are created unto good works. Amen. And so we are to do uh, what, we're, what the Word of God says based on the fact that, we, that His grace empowers us and what Jesus has done. So what Jesus has done, then we're to go out and do what He said do by that power. Amen. So Paul presents two sides of things. He presents a Godward side and he presents a manward side. And in the equation of redemption, there is a Godward side and there's a manward side. Uh, to be saved, Jesus went to the cross, shed his blood, went to heaven, offered his blood. It was accepted, sat down at the right hand of the Father where he ever lives to make intercession for us. On the manward side, we have to confess him as Lord and believe in our heart that God's raised him from the dead. Amen. Now, Jesus shed his blood for everybody, but pe people who don't confess him as Lord and people who don't believe in the heart that he's been raised from the dead don't get the benefit of him shedding his blood for them. As a matter of fact, I was just reading Revelation yesterday where it says, it talks about the Lamb's Book of Life where God did uh, the, 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 those whose names weren't blotted out. What happens? Those who die without confessing him as Lord and believing in their heart that God raised them from the dead. See, God had already counted them saved because Jesus didn't pay the price for them. But when they didn't accept it, they got blotted out. They didn't do the side of man, so they got blotted out. Well, that's no fun. I mean, to be in and then get kicked out. I mean, you know. But see, there's a manward side. And for people to come along and tell you that you have no, there's no responsibility on your part as a, as a person to engage in what God's plan is, is erroneous. Yeah. That's, that's error. And so Paul begins in Ephesians chapter 4 after he laid out the case of God's grace and what Jesus had done and presented that case. He comes right back behind that and begins to present the responsibility of man in engaging in what Jesus had done. So we call that the last half of the book, do. First half done, second half do. Amen. And so we went, we've, gone, we've gone through chapters 4, 5, and halfway through chapter 6. And uh, we, got, we got down to verse 10 in chapter 6 where Paul says, Finally, my brethren. Or, you know, we could say it this way. I'm going to sum it all up. Yeah. Be strong in the Lord. Well, praise God. And in the power of his might. Well, how, you know, listen, you, your strength isn't enough. Amen. You might be strong as a bull, but, you know, there's, 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 kind of like this, there's always somebody stronger. I think one, uh, you know, I think in the last that, uh, Star Wars, the first one, the the the, the prequel number one, um, you know, they're they're going through un, uh, that water planet and down through the center of the court, everything, and, and one fish comes after them, and then a big, and then a bigger fish comes and gets that fish, and the guy says, "There's always a bigger fish." Well, there's always a bigger fish. Amen. Now Nathan was supposed to wrestle the other, other day on Friday, but for some reason they bumped all the weight classes up. I must be in some agreement with the coaches. But when Nathan got bumped up, he got bumped out of the 220 weight. Now he, he wrestles at 220, although he weighs 201. So he's wrestling in the 220 weight. But the guy he was going to have to wrestle at, when he got bummed up weighed 265. So the coach just decided, you know, we're not going to put you out there because he'll just fall on you and crush you. You know? I mean, you know, and you understand, he, they didn't want him to get hurt because he'll, he'll go out there and try to beat him. And he'll try to do stuff with, you know, 265 is, is I mean, you know, whether you're you know, muscle or overweight or whatever, or a combination of the two, that's big. Yeah. Especially when you weigh 200. It's kind of like, you know, ever since those Marines try to wrestle the sumo wrestlers. Now, a simplified dude is tough. But, you know, when they go up against a guy who weighs 380 pounds, <laughs> they don't go anywhere. You know, the little Marine comes running into him. Boing! <laughs> you know? Now, give him a gun and give him some weapons, he'll take him down. 
But uh, otherwise, he just does the bouncy thing. You're, you know, but we're not to be strong in our strength. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Amen. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. There's a strength that comes out of God to deal with spiritual things and spiritual battles that does not come out of human flesh and human ability. And that's what Paul says, lean to that, lean to those things, praise God. And then he says, um, uh, put on the whole armor of God. I like to underline the word whole here because you know what? We need all of it. You don't need just one message from the Bible. You don't need one little aspect of the Bible. That's, the, that's my little pet peeve. Oh, we, all we need is love. Uh, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. You know, remember the hippie song? Everybody sang around, drove Coca-Cola, and, and sang what the world needs now is love. And went to Woodstock. You know? And, uh, you know, smoked dope and all that kind of stuff. Listen, that, that was the, I, I was a, a young teenager when all that was going on, but it was, you know, everybody, was, yeah, everybody was cool, baby. Peace, baby. You know, we were cool. Yeah, right on. All right, grow your hair real. I, I did have long hair. Um, you know, I mean, <laughs> anyway, it was down to my shoulders. I, can't, I know you can't imagine that. And it was wiry. I mean, if, if it got one of those days where human, I, I, they called me Bush. It just, I mean, I had a white fro some days. All right. Um, you know, <clears throat> but the world just needs love. What's he in there? People, all we need to teach is the love of God. Love, 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 love. And yet the Bible talks about faith. Talks about hope. Talks about grace. Talks about, um, you know, giving. You see, we need the whole. We need the whole, not part a whole. Amen. And, the, and when it comes to the armor of God, we're put on the whole armor of God. Not just a part. We need the whole armor. Amen. And, uh, and he says it's put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand against the wiles of the devil. What's that mean? If you're not fully equipped, you're, you're susceptible to, to attack and defeat. If you're not fully equipped, you are susceptible to attack and defeat. Now, when we put our soldiers over in um, Iraq at the beginning of the Iraq War, um, we, we had, they had weapons and they had you know, different things, but they weren't prepared for some of the things that the, the IEDs, so they had to go re, um, re, uh, refit all their, their um, the, the Humvees and everything with special armor and all this kind of stuff and, and turrets for the guys on the back because they, these IEDs are, are cell phone controlled. And I, I, of course, what I think, what I can't figure out is why each Humvee is not equipped with a phone dampering system. Cell phone dampering system. That's my question. Why not just when they're riding down the road, it just dampers everything within a certain radius around the vehicle, and because it costs money. Well, it could cost more money to pay pay uh, the, 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 for the soldier's family to have their benefits for the rest of their life, and plus the life of the soldier, you know. But that's that's another thing. But you know, but they, you know, you don't go out there un unequipped. You don't walk out there in a t-shirt. Hello. You need to be fully equipped. They need their Kevlar. They need their helmet. They need their weapon. They need all the things they have on to, to protect them. And the Word of God tells us to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand against the wiles of the devil. So to be fully equipped means that you're prepared to win. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And we covered that. You know, the person that gives you a hard time is not your problem. The devil behind them is. But against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. Says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore. One translation says, having fought the battle to the end, be ready, remain on the battlefield, ready to do battle again. Hallelujah. Yeah. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. We talked about last week how that truth, if we do not have the, the truth of God, the true counsel of God, everything else will be out of whack. Because the, the, the belt that Paul was referring to here in the Roman armor and the Roman weaponry was held every other the part of the armor in place. And see, truth holds every part of your life in place. Jesus said you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Isn't that right? Amen. And um, so, you know, truth, genuine, you know, pure, not, not, um, not mishandled, but truth. Holy, and then having on the breastplate of righteousness, we covered that last week. And then your feet shall with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer or all, one translation says, all manner of prayer and supplication in the spirit. Watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. 
Hallelujah. And we'll stop right there and let's pick back up here in verse 15 because this is where we are having your feet shod <coughs> with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, how many of you ever read that and kind of went, that's kind of awkwardly stated? I don't, you know, you kind of go, okay. And, and you hear somebody teaching the armor of God, yeah, and they're talking about the Roman soldiers, spikes on the bottom of the shoes, which is true. And, uh, and we kind of get on the fact, you know, they use that to march over and step on their enemy and all that kind of stuff. Some people get into that aspect of it. And, and that's not inaccurate. But, I, but I've done some study here, and it didn't take long because this word is only used one time in the entire Bible. Preparation. It's used one time in the entire Bible. And it means to put or keep in readiness... And, um, and it, it, so the gospel of Christ to which the soldier has been reconciled becomes his foundation or foothold for the battle at hand. In other words, those long spikes that Paul is referring to on the bottom of the Roman soldier's shoe, the gospel of peace is his foot foundation. Now, <clears throat> they had spikes there. Yes, part of it was for the stepping on them. Another part of it was for a good foothold in, in different terrains. Yeah. Now, I used to live in a house. When we first moved to Greensboro, we, when we bought a house a couple years after we moved here, we, uh, I had a front yard that, w that our house, when it was on a lot, the front yard went out like this, and then it went off for the house, and the, a little bit of the backyard, then it went back up for the backyard. And the kids loved that hill in the backyard. You used to take those little, little tight trucks and stuff. The girls would strap Nathan in, put a helmet on him, crash helmet, and just run him down the hill right into the house. <laughs> You know, I mean, they did all kinds of stuff. They looked out in the backyard one day. They had the bicycle helmet on him, his, his crash helmet. And there's a tree up by the playhouse. had a limb right there. And they had thrown a rope over the, the limb. And they had strapped him in like a rock climber. And he's holding on like this, legs strapped in. And they're hoisting him up. It was Jesse's idea. You know, see, they're hoist. We look out in the backyard and we're going, Jesse goes, oh, my, get the camera. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to video this event before we, we told him to stop doing it. Yeah, yeah. Nathan was the guinea pig. All right. But I'll tell you that, they, although the kids loved that hill, it was great for sledding when it got snow. You got to slide down the driveway, right out into the street, and try to miss the cars and that kind of stuff. You know, they were sliding down the hill uh, the other way. Anyway, uh, we, that, that hill was difficult to cut the grass on. If it was just a little bit wet... When you had on tennis shoes, you, you'd be pushing the thing and all of a sudden your feet would go out from under you and you're trying to make sure the lawnmower doesn't come that back down on you. Okay? I finally decided to pull out my old cleats and start cutting the grass with cleats on. Huh. Worked great! Uh, you know, I mean, I wasn't wearing to play baseball anymore. I wasn't playing, you know, actually these ball softball cleats. You know, retiring from baseball, you go back to playing softball, church league softball. Oh. You know, and, uh, you know, it's just because you want to play ball some kind. You know, and uh, but I had so I had my old soft church softball cleats, and uh, I would use those to cut the grass with, just so I wouldn't fall down. Now think about the Roman soldier on the different terrains they're on in battle. You can't afford to fall down. Yeah. And as a Christian, you don't need to fall down. Amen. So you have to have a firm footing. Amen. And so the spikes on those shoes became a, a symbolism in Paul about the firm footing of the gospel in your life. It is the foundation with which you stand in order to fight life's battles. You do not stand in, in how great you are. You do not sit in the mirror and look and say, how great I am, how great I am. You don't, you don't look about how, how wonderful you are. You know, I can defeat the devil because I got charisma, baby. You know, you don't defeat the devil because, you know, you can pump 360 in a set, you know, of 10. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You don't, you don't defeat the devil because, you know, you made the cover of some magazine. You know, you defeat the devil because your feet are firmly planted on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? The, rec the peace, the gospel of peace that reconciles you to God. Hallelujah. And so Paul says here, having your feet uh, shod with the preparation or the firm foundation, the firm footing. Amen? Now, uh, one Wood in his... Um, Expositor's Bible says that this word, and, I, and it's, just, it's just one of those Greek words that I'm not going to even try to pronounce, okay? But this word is, is used in secular Greek on tackling of a ship. The tackling of a ship. In other words, the equipping. So what Paul says here, you're equipped with the firm foundation of the gospel is where you make your stand with. Yeah. Okay? Praise the Lord. So you got a firm. So, so does that may help you understand feet shot with the preparation. That word preparation meaning firm footing, you know, firm foundation. You know, um, uh, you, you're, you're in a state of readiness. You're, you're, you're firm. You're founded. You're, you're, you're not movable. Amen. You can't be moved. 
We, and we talked about that when we talked about the winds of doctrine. You can't be tossed to and fro just because something sounds cool. Right. There are doctors out there right now. People hear them, and, you know, and, and because they're not firmly founded, they love the Lord. They go to church. But, you know, they're always looking for the new, you know, the new thing to kind of tickle their ear or their fancy or whatever that everybody can jump up and whatever about. And, and, and they'll run after it and be tossed. You don't need to be tossed. The problem with it being tossed is you've got to get back up and figure out where you're supposed to be again. Amen. <clears throat> and doctrine doesn't need to be throwing you all over the place. You should be going progressively up in understanding of the things of God. Not thrown over here and thrown over there. All right. Now, so he says, your feet shall be the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, or now, now this, we, we could preach above all, but really the Greek word is, is used to say beside or in other, otherwise and, and, and in addition to these things. Uh, take the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked or extinguish all the fiery missiles. One translation says extinguish all the fiery missiles. The shield of faith. The shield of faith. You're, you know, um, you present, let's understand this, the shield of faith is a front forward weapon. Part of your armor. It doesn't work if you turn tail and run. Amen? You will take it in the backside if you run. Hello? That was, that was weak, guys. You can't turn and run from the devil. You've got to run at it. You've got, you got to stay aggressive. You've got to stay forward. you got to keep... Why? why? The Bible tells us in the Old Testament that the Holy Spirit's our re-reward, and that literally means he takes up your backside. There's no sneak attacks coming to you from the back. If you get hit in the back, it's because you turned. Amen. Always stay forward. Always keep your faith out there. Always keep what, you know, and, and we release our faith out by saying what God's Word says. Keep your faith out there all the time. And when you keep your faith out there, Satan's throwing fiery darts or really, you know, flaming missiles, one translation says. And if you'll keep your faith out there, it'll extinguish them before they ever hit you. Well, how do I keep my faith out there? Jesus is the high priest of our profession or of our confession. We have to consistently speak God's Word, declare God's Word, say what the Word of God says about us, so when Satan comes along with his, with his uh, attacks, they're extinguished before they can hit and take root in our life. Amen. It's important. It's important to know what about God's Word says. It's important to declare what God's Word says about you. Now, some people, you know, a number of years ago, confession was a really big teaching, and, and people were doing it all the time. And then somewhere in there, we, we got to where, well, we don't really need to do that. And, everybody, so, and then people said, well, okay, and I don't need to do this. So they quit. Well, that, the point was, you know, of course, you understand, I don't think we need to have people tackling people for making a bad confession. Yeah. Or everybody trying to have a better confession than the other guy. Yeah. Y'all remember that, don't you? Somebody would confess something and somebody was out trying to out-confess them. Well, I'm blessed. Well, I'm blessed and favored and, and anointed and appointed and called. And I mean, it's like add-on on the trampoline game. Yeah. You know, they just kept going on it and after it and <clears throat> to the point that it became annoying. You know, your confession is not for Bill. Go ahead. Right. This is good. Your confession is not for me. Huh? Your confession is for you, between you and the Lord. Right. And if you spend as much time confessing it between you and the Lord as you did trying to tell everybody else so they would think you're cool, uh -oh. you'd be better off. That went over big. There's nothing wrong with sharing with other people. But I tell you, a lot of people, what people do is they make confessions to other people and they never really make them when they're supposed to. You should be declaring what God's Word says about you when you're riding down your car by yourself. Amen. Amen. Are you here or are you gone home? Okay, we're here. All right. The confession you make is, f is so that you can build faith in your heart. You can make a declaration before heaven so that Jesus can be the high priest of your confession. He is the high priest of our confession. And watch over it. Amen. It's not so we can come to church and out confess one another. And that's where, that's where we kind of started getting, you know, everybody's right. Well, you know, and... Um, Somebody come up to you and say, how are you doing? You say, well, I'm doing good. 
But I want you to know that I'm blessed coming in and blessed going out. I was blessed when I rose up, and I'll be blessed when I lie down. I'm blessed in the city, and I'm blessed in the country. I'm blessed in my cattle, and my field, and my oil, and my wine. I'm blessed. How do you all over the place? You can't out-bless me because I'm blessed, blessed, blessed. Okay, I get it. <laughs> but do you do that at home? Do you get up in the mirror and just look at yourself and say, how you doing? And go, I'm blessed coming in and I'm blessed. Uh, come on now. Uh -huh. Good question. So understand, you know, and so what happened was because people started getting, and, and this, I remember the day, boy, if somebody was to make a negative confession, you'd have 10 people jump out and go, I wouldn't say that if I were you. Yeah, yes, amen. That's right. And Brother Bill was one of those people. <laughs> And so was Pastor Ed. <laughs> people would tell me, you know, I'd say, they say, I've seen people I used to go to school with or, you know, that I knew B.C. Everybody know what B.C. is, don't you? Before Christ. Yeah. It's not B.C.E. You know, books, college books now no longer have B.C. or A.D. What? They have B.C.E., which is before current era, and C.E., current era, using the birth of Christ as the point to change between B.C.E. and C.E. A bunch of godless left-wing liberal book writers. Anyway. That's just exactly what it is. You know, but yet they, they still use the birth of Christ as the demarcation point of which one is which. But they're just, just, just determined by the devil to remove Jesus from anything. You know, the A.D. meant in the year of our Lord in Latin. And B.C. was before Christ. And that was, that was the, the, um, the, the basis of which we did all of our, our, our history stuff in, in the Christian world. And uh, now, now all the secularists have taken over the books. And so it's B.C.E. and C.E. I would go through and mark out everyone in the book just, just, just to be aggravated. Anyway, just tell you how it is. Hallelujah. <coughs> so, and of course, I'm, I'm sure they'll ask, some say, well, what's, when, did it, when did CE and BCE change? And they got to they try to go get around that one, you know. How did I get off on that? But anyway, so we would, we would jump all over somebody for a net. That's con How did I get on that out of confession? Oh, BC. That was before I got saved. You know, people I knew before I got saved, before, before Christ. I was, um, uh, you know, and I wasn't, I really, I, didn't, I wasn't, I never smoked dope. I didn't shoot up. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't like that. Now I did beat lockers in on my head and I was crazy and I did stupid stuff. And, and uh, you know, there, there, there were some things I did that weren't godly. A few things here and there. Um, you know, and I lived through them. Some of the things I did just amazing that I actually did live through them. Hallelujah. But, you know, those people see me and they say, what are you doing? Well, I got saved. I'm going to the ministry. Glory to God. And they, of course, you know, they're, they're backing up five steps, you know, that acting. Okay. But they would say, good luck. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, here. Here. Here's, 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 it's stupid. I go, look, I don't believe in luck. Luck's the root word of Lucifer. Yeah. No, they didn't. They were just trying to be nice. Yeah. That's called young and dumb on my part. All right. You know, I was one of those Christians who would run you off. You know, I don't believe in luck. Luck's the root and word of Lucifer. I'm blessed. <laughs> and of course they're going, whatever. You know, I liked you better before you got saved. Anyway. Well, that, you know, that wasn't, if I'm going to make that confession, I can make that by myself. I can get in my car and say, I don't believe in luck. Well, I'm, not, I'm blessed. Yeah. I'm not lucky. I'm blessed. I didn't have to make a big, you know, demon possessed, cast them out kind of thing out of my confession and just annihilate and people and, and embarrass them and make them feel stupid. And Christians, used to, and a lot of times, a lot of why we jumped all over people was we wanted everybody else to know we were spiritual. We had it right. How come we off on this? Because we got to talk about these things in church. Amen. Amen. Your confession, see, we're talking about the shield of faith. You know, it, your shield of faith isn't so you can slap up other people upside the head with it, show how big your shield is. Amen. Thank you for your enthusiasm. So we talk about confessing the word. You, do, you need to have a confession. You need to say what the things, God, things of God say. When events take place in your life, you can confess it without looking like a fool and acting like a fool and, and, and aggravating everybody else around you like a fool. Yeah. Amen. Now, I didn't call you a fool, so I'm not in, I'm not in trouble. But there are a lot of people who act like that, Christians. Oh, yeah, I was at, I was at a COPA meeting one time. 
And, and, and then this is the area of my life. For some reason, I had developed a habit of winking at people when I would, you know, I'd shake their hands and say, glory to God, and wink. And, and, I, and this guy, we would turn around and say, shake hands the guy behind you. I, I did that, shook his hand, and, and I winked. And he goes, the Bible said, he, and starts quoting all the scriptures about he that winketh. And I haven't been saved all that long. <laughs> You understand that when you get saved, you don't. You're, 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 you still got to deal with the unregenerated part of your flesh that wants to do stuff they shouldn't want to do. Because what I want to do was do the bam bam thing with him. You understand what I mean? When he did that, I had his hand. I want to go bam 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 bam, and uh, did think about it right there in the middle of the couple meeting. Hallelujah! I mean, it was like, oh, give me a stinking break. Oh, now you're more spiritual than me because you know that scripture and I winked. <laughs> that is not your shield of faith and your confession of faith. That's arrogance. Yeah. And it doesn't profit you as a believer to quench the fiery darts of the wicked to do that kind of thing. Right. Can I find an amen corner somewhere in this church? It doesn't profit you to be obnoxious. Right. Amen. It, it doesn't help your faith. It doesn't put out the fiery darts of the wicked for you to jump down Ben's throat because he said something you consider to be a negative confession. Yeah. And it may not profit him because he might get mad at you. You get him into sin. That's going, this is going over real good. <laughs> no, you're to take the shield of faith. Your, your shield of faith is established by the things you say. Well, then say them. Say them at home. Say them in your car. And if somebody comes up and makes a negative confession over you, all you got to do is on your breath and say, God, I just, I just don't receive that. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yeah, right, right. You don't have to cast the devil out of them. <laughs> Be a fool. You know? They can go on their merry world a little way, smiling. You can just go, I just don't receive that. Praise God. Thank you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God, I don't receive that in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. <laughs> and you keep your faith out there without, without just attacking people. Right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Because you bring another dynamic in when you do the other thing. Now, I know some of y'all laugh because you used to do it. <laughs> I wouldn't say that if I were you. Well, another thing, if you've got a relationship with a person and they've asked you to help them watch what they say, that's different. A different thing that's a completely different thing. You know, you're working together. You know, the, you know listen, brother, I, I know I'm, I'm saying stuff I shouldn't say and I don't even realize I'm can you help me? And still you need to do it in love. Right. And you need to do it with grace. Right. Now, brother, look, here's what you just said. That tickled me to death. You know, that's just not good confession. We, the, the believer should be speaking life. Amen. Shouldn't be talking about death all the time. That tickled me to death. Thought, last so hard, I thought I would die. You know? Um, now, if they've asked you to help them, that's a different thing. Now you're helping them. You're not, you're not even making a good, you're not sitting there going, well, I'll tell you what I would say. You know, listen. Then they say, what, what, what can I say instead? You know, when you say, you, know, you give, them, you help them. That's, that's, that's ministry. That's, and that's what people sometimes refer to as body ministry. You know, you're help, we're helping one another. We're and really, it's what Ephesians 4 talks about, that joints are supplying. When somebody's asked you to help them, you help them. You supply. Okay, that's an entirely different thing than, you know, you come to church today, you walk in, you hear Janice and uh, uh, Jesse back there talking, and one of them goes, Whoo, that's it, I got so tickled I thought I was going to die. And you jump in there and go, I wouldn't say that for you, you might die tonight. i tell you one thing, I'll live and not die and declare the works of the Lord, that's what I would say. So now you're not making a confession of faith. That was not a confession of faith. That was, in your face, I'm better than you, and I know more than you. And that's not the love of God. And that's not establishing the shield of faith through your confession to protect your life. All right, so if I hit that hard enough, have y'all got it now? All right, so what do we do? Well, when you rise up in the morning, make your confession. Get out of bed. Say, you know, I'm blessed today. When I leave, I'll be blessed. When I come home tonight, I'll be blessed. I've risen up, so I'm blessed. When I lie back down tonight, I'll be blessed. If I drive out into the country, I'll be blessed. If I'm in the city, I'll be blessed. I'm blessed in everything I set my hand to. Glory to God. The favor of God goes before me. And you can go on out of the house, get in your car, and keep right on going. 
I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Hallelujah. I can do all things through him that loved me. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm more than a conqueror through him that loved me. Glory to God. Nothing will separate me from the love of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Jesus lives big on the inside of me. And greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Hallelujah. And I overcome through my faith because it's the victory that overcomes the world. Glory to God. And I get faith because I feed on the word of God. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I'm a blessed man. I'm a blessed woman. Hallelujah. Whichever one you are. Hallelujah. You know, and, and the blessings of God overtake me. Favor goes before me with all men. Yeah. You talk like that in your car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You set your shit. And then you go out there somewhere and the devil starts throwing fire and missiles at you. Hallelujah. Praise God. And you're, you've been confessing in the morning, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. The enemy comes at me like a flood and the Spirit of God raises up a standard. Hallelujah. The banner. What banner? Jehovah Nisi. The, ban the, the, the Lord is our victory. Praise God. Hallelujah. And I win. I overcome. I'm an overcomer by him that loved me. Praise God. Glory to God. Jesus and me, we're more than enough. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> and then when the devil comes after you, your shield of faith already out there. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And then it extinguishes the fiery darts, praise God. Amen? Amen. Uh -huh. You didn't have to wait for somebody to make a negative confession so you could, oh yeah, I'm supposed to say something good. And you don't have to walk into your office and do it all over the office. Uh, can I have the intercom of the office, please? I want you all to know that I am a born-again Christian and I am blessed Good things happen to me today because I'm a believer. That's different. They come up and they're talking to you and you say something, you know. It's, it's the attitude by which we do things and the way we do things that determines it. Amen. Are you here? And it's different if you're doing it as a, te as a witness and a testimony. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you know, look, guys, I'll be honest with you. You know, I've served the Lord all these years, and I want you to know that, that I, I, because, because I love the Lord and I know how God is, I, I've, I've just watched him bless my life, and I'm blessed all the time. You know, and, and bad stuff that happens to other people doesn't happen, not because I'm anybody special, but because Jesus on the inside of me keeps me over the top. That's a, you know, if you're witnessing, that's one thing. Do you understand the difference in what I'm trying to say here? Now, but your shield of faith is established by what you say, and that's what's going to be done when you're in the car, when you're in the bathroom, when you're at, at home by yourself, uh, when you're, when you're uh, in uh, places of opportunity where you can do this freely um, to make your confession. Now, listen, I understand you might be in a battle somewhere and something happens and you just don't have time to go get off by yourself. Uh, you can still make your confession. Amen. Yeah. Now, I understand there's, there are certain times that, that um, necessity dictates things that, that you would not otherwise do. I'm just talking about a, a pattern of life. You need to live where your confession is establishing the shield of faith uh, in your life all the time. Amen? And it'll, it'll extinguish. And if you've already established it, when the fire dark comes, it gets put out. Hallelujah. And then verse 17 says, take the helmet of salvation. Uh, First Thessalonians says, uh, take the hope of salvation as a helmet. Hallelujah. Uh, your, your mind needs to be guarded with the revelation that you're born of God. Hallelujah. That things are different. You're not the same anymore. Amen. Yeah. Salvation, soteria in the Greek, and uh, coming from the Greek sozo. Understand in Greek, we take the, the noun receives this meaning from the verb, which is opposite in English. Okay, so the Greek word sozo, saved, means to save, to heal, to preserve, to make whole, to restore. So then soteria comes, comes in and, and receives this meaning from the verb. So it's, it's, um, it, it's salvation, it's wholeness, it's health, it's restoration. Not restoring, but restoration. And so when you put on the helmet of salvation, you're putting on the helmet of restoration, of wholeness in the soul, in the mind. Amen. We're to renew our mind with the word of God. You know, James said, receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul, your suke, not your pneuma, not your spirit, but your soul, the mind, the will, the intellect, the emotions. To save sozo. So put on the helmet of salvation. Put on the helmet of wholeness over your soul, over your thinking. Think different. You're not the same person you used to be. You are not. You are not. Say, I am not, whatever Pastor is about to say. You are not a sinner saved by grace. Amen. That is not a biblical term. That is not biblical terminology. That is not a biblical principle. 
you were a sinner, you were saved by grace through faith, but now you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's what the Bible says, not it. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Amen? Amen. And all things are of God. Verse 21 goes on and says this, And he who knew no sin was made sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The Bible says, Be holy as he is holy. The Bible calls us saints. Yeah. Amen. But not one time does it call you a sinner saved by grace. Right. So you need to stop thinking like that. You know, stop doing anything that song. I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. Why would you sing that? See, that's why we don't sing around here. We don't sing that kind of song around here. Yeah. We sing, I am the righteousness of God in Christ, a brand new creature in Him. I'm a partaker of His divine nature. To me, He will not impute sin. I sing that instead of, I'm an old sinner saved by grace. Was a sinner, was saved by grace, but now, yeah. not one day on the other side, but now I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. There's a big difference between being a sinner saved by grace and being the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. In your thinking. Why? Because one's defeatist. One, you're always, oh, I just wish I could measure up. Whoa, I just wish I could be, you know, please God. Oh, I just wish somehow, some way, you know, the Lord would, would accept me the way I am. The other one is, you're, you're talking about a position that Jesus has procured for you. And you're living in by faith under his grace. Glory to God. Amen. And that you didn't earn it, but it's been made available to you. When you received Jesus as Lord, now you stand in that place. Amen. <clears throat> Ephesians says, he raised us up together, Ephesians chapter 2, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It does not sound like a sinner saved by grace when he says stuff like that. Amen. Amen. Well, people go out and write songs. I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. I was with some family recently. They pulled out some videos. These guys singing. And they loved this. They went and found this song. Now, I'm just no sinner saved by grace. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, don't let me throw up Jesus. <laughs> don't let me barf on this one. <clears throat> now, what did you do? I didn't rebuke my family. Just smiled at them. Huh? Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm talking about how much they loved it. I'm thinking, hey, let's move on. <laughs> yeah, let's find another one. Hallelujah. You know? Hey, I got some good stuff. Y'all want to hear it? <laughs> Glory to God. So, have, you, have your mind renewed to, to who you are in Christ. Put on that helmet of salvation, the hope of your salvation. Understand what it means to be born again, to be in Christ, so that you think different, so that you take a different attitude or a different position. Now, um, you can be the same race. So you can be a Christian. The Bible talks about two races of people in the New Testament. The Gentile, well actually three. The Jew, the Gentile, and the church of God. All right? So you have the natural descendants of Abraham, the heathen, Gentiles, and then the church of God. Amen. Now we're not talking about the denomination. We're talking about the body of Christ. All right? And there's, I ain't going there. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. But the attitudes of all three uh, are different. Now, uh, we have a friend. He's been to this church a number of times. Ken Kasich. He is ethnically Estonian. Now, when I mean ethnically Estonian, his parents are Estonian. They escaped from Est Estonia to Sweden and ended up in Toronto, Canada, where he, he grew up. Um, Toronto has the second largest Estonian population in the world because that's where they, that's just for some reason, that's where they all started going and landing there. And that's where they stayed when they escaped from the Soviet Union. Now, Ken is Estonian. His, his name is Kasik. I think it's pronounced a little bit different in Estonia. They have the funny punctuation marks of it when they spell it there and all that kind of stuff. He is, he is Estonian. Looks Estonian. You walk around, you see him walk around people, and uh, just looks wise, he looks like them. Ken's Estonian. I mean, how do you explain that? I don't know. You just go in and watch the Estonians walk around, you look at him, you see him, you wouldn't think anything different just by his features. Okay? Now, when he first went into Estonia in 1989, it's still under Soviet rule. All right? And, and you understand, you know, a lot of those, those countries have kiosks. They have little kiosks to buy a hot dog or, you know, of course, in, in, in their dinner in the Soviet Union, most of what the kiosks were for was to buy vodka. 
because they're all drunks. Right, you live under communism long enough, there's no hope, there's no vision, there's no future. They just get drunk, they just uh, live their life drunk. But, but Ken walked up to a kiosk to buy something one day, and, and, uh, and the guy started, spoke to him in English. They didn't understand that the Russians, they taught them English as much as they taught them a, a Russian. Because they, they want to, you know, want to uh, uh, assimilate our societies. And uh, he walked up and, and the guy says, you're an American, aren't you? Now, he's Estonian. His face looks Estonian. And he goes, well, yeah, how did you know? He said, the way you walk. Nothing to do with his looks. It was the way he carried himself, his attitude. The attitude by which he presented himself was totally different than the Estonians. They all walked with their head down. You know, they, when I first went in 92 and started preaching there, uh, they wouldn't even smile. You'd preach your guts out. I'd jump up on the tables and preach. And finally I asked, I said, what is it with that? They're not smiling. They said, well, they, see, they, they say Americans make faces. Yeah, because we're walking down the street, we're like this. See somebody go, hey. That's how we do, you know. We're just, we're, we might be, we have this look on our face. See somebody we know or, or whatever. We go, hey. <laughs> and they don't like that. So they just really be sour puss all the time. <laughs> you know. They're very stoic. Well, you live 70 years. Actually, if you go study the, the history of Estonia, uh, before uh, 1992, they had 80 years of liberty at 800 years. They were a sovereign nation for 80 years out of the last 800 years. Because the, 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 the Swedes would overrun them, the Finns would overrun them, the Germans overrun them, uh, you know, the Swiss. I mean, every, everybody just coming. They just always, whoever got run out of Estonia, somebody else would run in and take over. Yeah. You know, they just, and they're supposed to be, you know, um, warriors. <laughs> yep, finally the Russians took them. All right, anyway. But they walk around head down, solemn. Look, here comes Ken walking upright, confident. If you go overseas, if you travel a lot, you'll find out you can almost spot, and this is true about, about anywhere you go, you can spot Americans just by how they walk. Mm -hmm. There's an attitude. Amen? And that attitude presents a confidence. Some people call it cocky. I'm going to use for our purposes confident. <laughs> confident assertion. Amen. You know? And um, so you're, you know, Kim walks up the thing and says, you're an American? Yeah, how'd you know? Well, it's the way you walk. You know, his attitude, although he was ethnically Estonian, his parents were Estonian, they taught him Estonian as a kid, and so he spoke Estonian, because they wanted to make sure they didn't lose their language. His attitude presented him differently. And when we start, I, I said I was going to finish this day, it's not going to happen. Um, I'll have to go change my Facebook post. <laughs> Finishing the book of Ephesians today. I'm going to have to go back and put a comment. Not, all right. <coughs> Although he was Estonian by birth, by, by natural race, Estonian, they culturized, they, the family made sure they were cultured in Estonian things, although they lived in a different place. And he had moved back to his, his homeland. His attitude presented something different. And you've got Christians walking around who are Christian ethnically. You understand what I'm talking about? They've been born again. But they're living under the oppressive regime of Satan, still defeated. There's no joy in their face. There's no life in them. Because they haven't had a revelation of what it means to be free. See, the only difference between Ken and the others was he had lived free, and they hadn't. He knew what it was to be free. They didn't. And even when freedom came, for years, I'd go back, they were still like that. Now, that's changing. <clears throat> it's been um, this next year, well, uh, uh, last year, it was 10 years since the, the Russians, the Estonians seceded from the Soviet Union. Uh, August 20th, 1990, they seceded from the Soviet Union. And, um, and there's a big boulder there because they put boulders up, they moved earth movers out, because the Russians sent the T-1 tanks in, to go, they, were, they were going to blow the capital up. They got out there, surrounded the city, ran out of gas. People took them food. They got out of the tanks and walked home, left the tanks there. You know. And um, praise the Lord. But so it's, taken, it's taken 10 years for them to, uh, of being free to start acting that way somewhat. 
So you go back and you visit, and each, each time I go back, you see more liberty. When I first went, every car in, in parking lots was that Lada, L-A-D-A. Now, if you don't know what a Lada is, it was a Fiat 131 sedan that the Russians stole, uh, took, and back engineered and did a really bad job of back engineering it. And they had three colors, deep burgundy, black, and this oh, four, blue, and this ugly green. That was it. And they always broke down. But that's the only car you, you couldn't see a car in a parking lot that wasn't a lot of, or that Muscovic thing or whatever. Some, some dumb car that they, the richer Russians had. Now you go, you can't, the only place you see those cars are in the junkyard. They're driving Beamers and uh, Volvos and Aldis and Mercedes. That's all you see them driving now. That's, all, that's the only car you see them driving in Tallinn. You don't see them driving the Lada. I found a field with about a bunch of Lada sitting out there rusting. <laughs> they were rusting before they got to the field. They just left them out there. But their attitude's changing. And so now you see them, they've got their heads up because they've been experiencing liberty. <coughs> we as believers are to feed on the Word of God and understand the liberty that Jesus purchased for us. And it'll change your attitude. Yeah. It'll change how you think. Put on the hope of your salvation. Put on the helmet of salvation. So that in this world where there's so much defeat and everything, you stand in a different way. You hold yourself in a different way. And they may call it cocky, but it's just confident assurance that Jesus has paid away where there was no way. Can you say amen? amen. And when you walk up, the devil will say, I know you. You're a Christian. Yeah, I am. Hallelujah. And this is your wrong day to open my door, pal. Amen? You knocked on the wrong door today, dude, because I'm born again, spirit-filled, tongue-talking, Bible-toting, and devil-whooping Christian, praise God. Because greater is he that sent me than he that's in the world. Now bring it on, devil. See, I wouldn't say that if I were you. Why not? Hey, Jesus has got my back. Just bring it, son. Bring it. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. See, your attitude changes. There, you, there's a difference between Christians who are living, and you know, uh, you, you never know what God's going to do. Oh, I just tell you, you, you just, the, the Lord's put me through the ringer. Oh, it's been a hard old way. Did you see what Jesus said, uh, the, my yoke is easy, my burden is light? He didn't say anything about a hard old way. Right. Jesus didn't say that. But Christians do. Yeah. Some Christians go, oh, I've been in the way for 40 years. That's your problem. You've been in the way. <laughs> Get out of the way. Get filled with faith. Have your mind renewed to the Word of God. I mean, say what the Bible says about you. Praise God. I'm more than a conqueror through him that loved me. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You start talking victory talking, you'll stand up. Amen. Amen. I can prove it to you. Go to a church service and start saying, you bunch of sinners saved by grace. You won't get a bunch of amens. The whole, you'll take the air right out of the room. I'm telling you, there's a devil's hell waiting for you the minute you mess up. You're not going to get a bunch of amens. You'll get everybody at the altar praying, oh God, don't let me go to the devil's hell. But start telling people what the Bible says. You've been born again. You passed from death unto life. Your name is in the Lamb's book of life and not blotted out. Glory to God. Jesus is your hero. Jesus is your, is your champion, praise God. He is the banner of victory over your life. You've been washed by the blood and kept by the blood. Glory to God. Jesus has made a way for you where there is no way. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Praise God. Satan is defeated. God is exalted. And Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. And I want you to know the day that when you step out in faith, the Bible says that your faith will work. Glory to God. And you win the battles. Hallelujah. Because you're equipped with all the weaponry you need to win. I got amens. I didn't get any amens when I was saying you're a bunch of dogs. It's the attitude as a Christian by which we approach life. And that attitude is birthed out of God's word. I'm not talking about making stuff up. I'm not talking, listen, I am not referring to the power of positive thinking. Because my thoughts are not enough to put me over. 
My, God said, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts and my ways than your ways. So what does that mean? I have to exchange mine for his. Well, how do I exchange mine for his? I get his word because his word is what he thought. And I, and I renew mine, my thoughts with his thoughts so that I speak what he says. That produces victory. That's not the power of positive thinking. That's the power of believing what God said and declaring it over your life. Amen. Keeping your mind stayed on him. Protected and safe. Amen. Amen. And you win. Oh, you win. <coughs> In the Roman army, they just didn't think they could be defeated. They had weapons nobody else had. They had techniques and, and strategies nobody else had. And I'll tell you, if they ever got defeated, they, they were surprised. Now, as a believer, we shouldn't be defeated because Jesus, you know, Jesus covers us. But a lot of Christians are defeated because they don't have the right attitude. And they run at the first sight of trouble. And that's right. Stop running away from the battle. Run toward it. Hello? Change the way you think to the fact that you're the conqueror, you're the winner. You know, Paul said we are more than conquerors. I like that. Through him that loved us. More. Stop running away from trouble and run at it with faith. Praise God. Amen. Next, uh, next time we're together, now, um, <laughs> we expect you to be here next Sunday, although I won't be. Because uh, I'll be driving back from Oklahoma. And uh, so we, we have somebody else preaching. I haven't asked them yet, so I'm not going to announce it until I ask. Make sure they're going to be able to do it. They don't want to do it in front of everybody. <laughs> somebody else preach. Hallelujah. The following Sunday, we're going to pick back up here, talk about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And then we, we will attempt to finish Ephesians next Sunday, two weeks, two weeks from today. Hallelujah. But before then, we have, we have Thanksgiving. You have church with, with somebody else here next week, but you be here. Amen? Now look, uh, tonight we have prayer. Uh, also that first Sunday, uh, two weeks from today, we are our, our prayer, I mean our healing and our communion service. So be here for that. Praise God. So the first Sunday night of the month is, is uh, communion and, and healing rally. Amen. Amen. So make sure you're here for that. Bring sick folk. Find sick folk. If you know people that are sick and they can't come, get handkerchiefs and bring them. We'll pray over them. Amen. Praise God. We've had miracles take place with handkerchiefs. Yeah. I mean, we've had extreme miracles. I mean, stuff that you just, you know, you go, my God. Uh, all for handkerchiefs. So praise the Lord for handkerchiefs. Amen. Yeah, amen. We've had people that had dealt with demon spirits uh, messing with them. And the wives just came. We pray. They, just, they didn't even tell the husband. They just put the thing in the pillow. Hmm. Pillowcase. And they got free. The anointing. You know? Because they got mad probably wouldn't use the pillow. Well, we'll just sneak him in. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. So that's two weeks from tonight. Hallelujah. Our communion healing rally. Praise God. All righty. Uh, let's stand up. Uh, Christian, Joe, glad you guys came. Yeah. All right. Make sure you go buy our books. Did the ushers get you anything yet? Yep. That's it. <laughs> There's a little registration card there. If you, you know, take that by our bookstore. We got a gift for you. All right? Praise God. Hallelujah. And we'll make sure somebody goes and lets you in the bookstore. <laughs> Again, make sure somebody's got that covered. All right? Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Look, tonight at 6 30, we're praying. And uh, and youth has their has their service. I'm just kind of waiting to see if there's anything God wants to do besides let us go home right now. Praise God. You know, uh, we don't have to rush out, but if he didn't take, listen, if the Spirit of God is not going to minister, uh, we're not going to do stuff just to do it. Mm -hmm. Ed, Ed can't heal a gnat. Ed can't fix anything, but the Holy Ghost can. Amen. Amen. The power of God can. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. All right.